fail tonight. If you have your Bibles and you'd open them to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, the very first book. Just bear in mind tonight as we read this that Paul is very soon to die. When Paul wrote 2 Timothy, he knew that in a sense his his days and his hours were numbered. He knew that he was very soon to pass from this life into the next. So these are some of Paul's last admonishments to his apprentice, to his son in the Lord. Verse 6. These are some of his last words. So, you know, last words are important words. What's really pressing on somebody's heart is what they tend to speak about uh, as they're facing their last days and their last moments. And Paul writes, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, standing in honor of the reading of God's word, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, the good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Master, we love you tonight, and we love your word, and we're grateful, God, for every single opportunity that we have to hear from heaven. Tonight, God, you've placed uh, your, your message in my spirit, and I pray, God, that you'd help me with your great anointing to deliver it in such a way, God, that it would do a great service to the kingdom of God, that every hearer, Lord, whether they be in this building or whether they be far away and they hear one day by internet or by tape, let every hearer be touched, God, let every person that hears this message, Lord, receive from you that which you would have them to receive. For we ask it in none other name than the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. <sighs> Look in the toe. That's my title. Look in the toe. I'm going to throw you off now. We've just come through the Christmas season. And many children ran into their living rooms on Christmas morning to massacre package after package in search of gifts that were left by Santa or proposed to have been left by Santa. But how many children year after year failed to even look into the stockings that their parents had hung by the chimney with care? I remember as a child that I was scarcely ever aware that the stockings even existed. After all, the good stuff had to be big stuff. So it had to be under or at least somewhere near the Christmas tree if it was going to get my interest. The stockings, mom would put all these little doodads in there and, you know, uh, uh, Hot Wheels and all that. I, I, wasn't looking, I wasn't looking for nothing in the stocking because I was looking for the big, the good stuff, you know, that really got your attention. And I remember as a kid, my mother used to get us, uh, on a lot of Christmases, she would get us the Avon decanters that looked like automobiles and with a cologne in them, you know, and you'd use that as a stocking stuffer too, wouldn't you? You didn't wrap those. Yeah, and she'd put them, she would put, but they were collectibles, and she told us they were collectibles. And she'd put them in the stocking. So really, there was some great stuff in those stockings. But we were, sometimes we'd be so caught up 
in what was under the tree and the things that were big and the things that really got your attention that we would fail to even notice the stocking, never mind what was in the stocking. Sometimes we expect the gifts that God has to offer us to be so great and extravagant in their size and in their uh, presentation that we often overlook the greatest and most valuable gifts. So many people think they know, as an example, so many people think they know what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is going to do for them. Well, when I get the Holy Ghost, this is how my life will change, and this is what it will do for me. And I think tonight I'm going to clear up some misconceptions and false teachings that have been prevalent in the Pentecostal movement. And notice I am clearly, specifically speaking of false teachings that in the Pentecostal movement. Because there have been some Lulus. We've had some real, real wing-dingers come through over the last 40 years that I've been around, I'll tell you. And over the years, you know, so many preachers preach so many things about the Holy Ghost baptism that what happens is somebody could get it and they wouldn't recognize it because it didn't manifest itself the way they thought it was supposed to. Amen. If you think when you get the Holy Ghost baptism, you're going to be perfect and you're never going to lose your temper anymore and you're never going to cuss and you're never going to do this and you're never going to say that and you're just going to be flat out perfect and everything's going to change and God's going to make you so holy you'll be able to walk on water and you'll never take a bath again because you'll float on top of them. You know, if you think that's what's going to happen, guess what? You're wrong. It don't work that way. And how grateful many of us are because they don't make enough <laughs> deodorant to cover up an unbathed person. So we're grateful tonight that everybody is able to get in the tub and immerse themselves in water and clean up. But you see, if we have a false conception about the gift, then a lot of times it takes away from our ability to enjoy the gift. Right? There's some people that They'll look at a gift and they'll think, well, good God Almighty, why did Grandma give me that? I remember as a kid, you know, if you remember, <laughs> it used to be that if you were given board games, you'd look at your grandmother with cross-eyed and was like, oh, good God, who wanted board games? Nobody wanted board games. Now, as I've grown older, I have literally grown to appreciate board games, and it's because Grandma Morrow used to give us board games. If she didn't give them to us, we'd never gotten them, <laughs> and I would have never learned to appreciate them. You see what I'm saying? But at the same time, when, when you look at a gift sometimes, it doesn't look quite like you thought it was going to look, or you didn't, it doesn't do quite like you thought it was going to do. So you don't recognize and appreciate it for what it really is. And there are gifts that God gives his people that oftentimes we do not recognize that gift and we do not appreciate that gift because it don't look like we thought it was going to look. We're looking under the tree and we're saying, well, where's the Holy Ghost baptism? I'm going to speak in tongues for 10 days, and I'll, I'll be passed out, and I won't even be able to go to work. I'll be so happy in the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm just going to be flat out, and just, uh, I don't know, you know. And we've got all these ideas about what the experience is going to be. And then it may have come into our life, and you know what? We didn't recognize it when it came because it didn't come the way we thought it would come. It didn't appear the way we thought it would appear. Sometimes you've got to quit looking under the tree and you've got to check out the stocking and see what's in the stocking. But then, you know, it's not enough to merely look in the stocking, but sometimes you've got to really dig deep in that stocking because sometimes there's a little item that will find its way right down into the very, very, very bottom, right into the toe of that stocking. And if you don't really dig in there with your hand and try to find everything you can get, then guess what? You're going to pass it up. You're not going to know what's there. You're going to put your stocking away at Christmas time, and there's going to be something potentially very, very, very valuable in there for you, and you're going to miss it. The Apostle Paul recognized that many of God's people had received gifts from God, particularly early in their lives, 
but they simply hadn't really discovered the gift uh, because it was stuffed way down in the toe of their stocking. And Paul's writing to Timothy, and he said, stir up the gift that is within you. Stir up the gift of God that is within you. Stir it up. There's something, Timothy, that's deep down inside that you may have that you don't even realize is there. God may have given you something already, and you don't think you've got it, but you do. You, it's down inside you, and you don't even recognize it. Why? Because when you got it, you didn't see it for what it was. Uh huh. <laughs> now listen to this now. I'm going to get a little bit deeper here in a second. Right now I'm just waiting. Not waiting, waiting. Okay, a lot of children may have enjoyed the candy that filled the upper portion of the brightly colored boot shaped sleeve, but they somehow missed what had been placed deep, deep down within. Oh, I want to tell you today, the Pentecostal movement is blessed with so many wonderful truths that thrill the hearts of God's people. But over the course of our history, this movement has seen far more than one crazy goofball preacher claiming to have a new revelation from the Lord. We've seen our share of wrong or even false and erroneous doctrine. And some of it has even carried the day, meaning that it stayed with the church in spite of its erroneous nature. I'll, I'll give you an idea of some of the goofball doctrines. Of some, now, I wouldn't even call it a doctrine, just beliefs that have kind of found their way into the church, and there are so many that believe these things. The devil cannot understand you when you speak in tongues. I'm going to tell you. Now, you all know how much I revere Brother Gillum and how much I admire Brother Gillum. Brother Gillum believed this like all hellfire. He believed with every ounce of his being, boy, when you got in the Spirit and you were praying in the Spirit, that the devil couldn't understand a word you're saying. And I was saying, well, why couldn't he? Are you trying to tell me if you're speaking Japanese, he can't understand a Jap who's praying either? Just because they're speaking something different than English? What, is the devil limited to English? <laughs> Which is? Oh, right. Well, that's, that is, that's another, that's another one of the belief systems. That's another one of the, the erroneous thought processes. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm become a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. So many people took that to mean that there is an angelic language, that God has a language of his own, so to speak, that he communicates in. And that uh, when some people speak in tongues, they're speaking in that language. I don't believe that. First of all, anybody that's ever had an experience with angels, they can almost nine out of ten times, they'll tell you, if you've ever read any books, have to deal with it, that angels don't even speak with their mouths. They'll tell you that, that the, the angel communicated with them at a, what we would consider a telepathic level. They said the angels spoke and they heard it and they knew what it was saying, but he never moved his lips. They could, they could hear him head to head. So I don't believe that, because if that's true, then when you're speaking in tongues, you could go. <laughs> and you and God can just talk head to head, and you don't, need, you don't need to open your mouth at all. But see, that is one of the erroneous ideologies that has permeated the Pentecostal movement. It's so stupid. The Bible clearly teaches that when you pray in the Spirit, that it is the Spirit of God who is helping you to pray. And for that reason, you are praying in the perfect will of God. So when you pray in the Spirit, you're scaring the devil to death from the standpoint of you are praying according to the perfect will of God. And there is, you are on a direct pipeline to heaven, and he can't interrupt you, and he can't get in the way, and that's what bothers him. But the notion that he doesn't understand what you're praying, no, that's not true. Because whatever language you might be speaking in that you have not learned that God is enabling you to speak with, that doesn't mean the devil don't know that language. Of course he knows that language. There's another ideology that I can't stand, and this is one that I've heard recently from someone, mom's super manager at her apartment complex. Well, sometimes God heals folks by taking them home. That's not a healing, that's death. <clears throat> That whole notion was 
was literally, I'm going to tell you right now where that came from. That came from faithless people who don't know how to believe God for a miracle, and when the Lord goes ahead and takes somebody home, they turn around and say, well, bless God, that was the way, that was God's way of healing that person. Baloney. Baloney. I'm going to tell you right now, I, you can have people that I believe, honestly, in my heart, I believe if somebody wanted to live to be 190, they could. If they could believe God and wanted to believe God, they could. But you know what? The average human being gets tired of life after a while, and they get ready for home. So they stop asking God for more time, and they stop believing God for more time, and they start asking God, take me home. I remember my grandfather, as he was getting into his 70s, his later 70s, he used to say to me, I'm just ready to go. I'm tired. I'm just ready to go. I'm ready. He wanted to go home. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Once you've made it through so many years and you've done your time and you've done all this, it's like, okay, Lord, now I'm ready. Take me home. And there's, the Bible said, blessed in the eyes of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. God is pleased when one of his children come home. And it's a blessing when God takes us home. It is a blessing, but it is not a healing. God can heal your body and this excuse that people die anyway. And you know, No, they, the reason that they've died has nothing to do with that's how God chose to heal them. If God had chosen to heal them at all, they'd still be here. Christine was a young lady at the Riverside Church that I, I love. She was a real precious, precious lady. And she had cancer. And Brother Gillum had long since retired the, the Riverside Church, and they had a new pastor in. And in all frankness, Mom knows this, I had absolutely no use for that new guy whatsoever. As far as I'm concerned, that was one charlatan and a fake, and I had no use for that man at all. And that poor girl paid the price for it in a lot of ways because when she needed a pastor and she needed somebody who could pray the prayer of faith, when she needed somebody who could inspire her faith and who could encourage her to believe God, she didn't have it. So here she wound up passing from this life and going on into, into eternity at an early age. I mean, I don't think she was more than, what, not even 40. Yeah. Yeah, she was such a young lady, beautiful, beautiful young lady. I loved her. She was such a sweetheart. But God didn't heal Christine by taking her home. God didn't heal Christine. Yes, he took her home, but he did not heal Christine. Because had he healed her, then her body would not have uh, passed with that particular ailment in it. Now, here's another misconception that's been taught in the church over the years that's erroneous and stupid. If you ask God for something more than once, you're operating in unbelief. Once you ask for it, then you should just quit asking. No. If you don't get, if you ask God to heal you today and you're not healed today, you have every right to go back and say, Hello, Lord, it's me again. You remember the story in Scripture of the woman who went to the door of the unjust judge and she began to knock on the door and say, Please come avenge me of my adversary. I've got this matter I need tended to. And the judge said, Hey, I've got folks visiting from out of town, and I'm tired, and I'm in bed, and I'm not going to get up to deal with your situation right now. But she kept knocking, and she kept knocking, and she kept knocking. And finally the judge said, Lord, have mercy, I'll never get any sleep. I better get up and take care of this. And Jesus said, if an unjust judge is going to respond to persistency, how much more will your heavenly Father respond to your persistency? And like I've taught people, every time you go to God in prayer and ask Him for something, all you're doing time after time after time is exercising your faith. If I didn't believe He'd do it, I wouldn't keep asking. Amen. If I didn't believe God was going to do it at some point, I wouldn't keep asking. If you didn't believe your daddy would buy you that candy bar, then once you asked him one time, Daddy, would you buy me this candy bar? No. You'd quit asking. But you know your little charms, and you know your little sweet smile, and you know your little puppy dog eyes. Eventually, you're going to melt the heart, and Daddy's going to buy you that chocolate bar, so you keep asking. That's how faith works. 
See, not everything comes to us the minute that we ask. It's not because God's withholding. The Bible teaches us that we are in a spiritual climate. We are in a spiritual warfare. The Bible teaches us that even as we exist here on earth, there's a battle that's being raged in the heavens. The, the scripture tells us that the angel of God had to fight with Satan over the body of Moses for heaven's sake. Who cares? Why would Moses be interested in where, uh, why would uh, Satan be interested in where Moses' body was? Why was that of any interest to Satan? I'll tell you why. Because God had a use for it. You remember who appeared when, at the transfiguration in front of the Lord Jesus? Do you remember who the two figures were? Elijah and Moses. So God had a use for Moses. And he wanted Moses to appear before the Lord in the transfiguration. But guess what? The children of Israel, once the Lord had taken that body, they never saw it again. So they have no idea to this day where Moses' body is. That's right. The Jewish people have no idea. They know where Joseph's buried. They know where Abraham and Sarah are, but they can't find Moses because God took Moses. So when God has a use for something, you better believe the devil is going to try to get his hands on it. And there's a warfare that's being raged in the heavens. And sometimes when you need a miracle, when we need a miracle in our church, and when we need a blessing, and we pray and we ask God and we plead, Lord, we need some money or we need this or we need that, the Lord's up in heaven saying, okay, Michael, fill up the satchel with some cash. They need some money. Bring it down to him. But while Michael is coming from there to here, the enemy's going to do everything in his power to slow up the show. He's going to do everything. When you need your healing, when I lie in that hospital bed dying five years ago, don't you know the devil was fighting with everything he had to keep that healing from coming? He didn't want me healed. He didn't want me delivered. He wanted me to curse God and die like, like uh, Job's wife encouraged him to do. He was waiting for me to turn my back on God and say, well, God ain't going to help me no way. But you know what? Whether it comes slow or whether it comes fast, I believe in God anyhow because one day it'll get here. That's faith. That's the nature of faith. But see, that's one of those erroneous concepts. If you ask God for something more than once, you're acting in unbelief. Garbage. Here's another ridiculous concept. God wants us all to be rich. We have the prosperity movement that says, God wants us all to be rich. I have news for you, Mr. Copeland. I have news for you, uh, some of you knuckleheads, Bob Tilton and some of you characters out there. The sad reality of the situation is this. First of all, the Bible said that God gives to every man according to his ability to receive. Mm -hmm. Handling money is not my best suit. I admit it. I'll tell you straight up. I'll tell you. It's, it's not my best suit. I would much rather have a church treasurer that could handle it that I wouldn't, if I never had to look at a dime that the church took in, if he just handed me, said, Brother Morrow, here's your tithe, that's yours, go with it. And I never saw a dime come into the church, and if he paid the electric bill, and he paid the rent, and he paid, I'd be thrilled. Yeah. Some churches have that. Yeah. Okay, we don't have enough people to have it, so right now I've got to handle everything. But handling money, I will tell you in all honesty, is not my strong suit. See, I admit my weaknesses. I don't, that's one thing this preacher believes in. I don't believe in standing there acting like you're something when you're not. Money is not my best suit. It's not to say I'm the kind of person who just goes out and spends money that needs to be used to pay the rent. No, the rent gets paid. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that sometimes I can be a bit frivolous. Sometimes I can make some pretty dopey little purchases along the way, and, you know, and it just isn't really all that necessary. And then later I'll say, oh, doggone it, if I had just saved that, I could have used it toward the phone bill when the phone bill came in later or whatever, you know. And the fact is God doesn't always give us all everything because we couldn't handle it. We can sit here and say, I could handle it. Yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. But see, God knows. We don't. He knows how it would affect us. He knows how it would change us. The Bible said, they that would be rich fall into a snare. So the Lord knows, you know what? 
I know Chuck thinks he'd be all right if I handed him a million dollars tomorrow, but if I handed him a million dollars tomorrow, you know what? He'd be in debt up to his ears after a year. And he knows it, or whatever, you know. I, I heard Aunt Dorothy. Here's another false concept that I've heard recently. Aunt Dorothy brought this to my attention. It kind of made me laugh when she said it because I didn't say anything to her. But old Patsy, Sister Patsy, God bless Patsy. Patsy could find fault with the most saintly person on the face of this planet. She was very, very legalistic and, you know, holiness stuff. But Aunt Dorothy had gotten the Holy Ghost. But I guess that Patsy decided Aunt Dorothy wasn't talking in tongues right. Oh, my gosh. And she told Aunt Dorothy, well, you need a clear tongue. And Aunt Dorothy says, well, I thank God that Patsy brought this to my attention. And I sat there and I thought to myself, brought it to your attention? Where in Scripture? Where in Scripture does she get that notion? A clear tongue. In other words, I guess in, in Patsy's mind, what it amounted to is Aunt Dorothy was speaking in tongues, but maybe she was just repeating the same thing over and over or something, and she was like, the Lord needed to basically give her a clear language, you know. But you know what? I don't see that in Scripture. I'll tell you why I don't see it in Scripture, because there is such, there's such foolishness, folks, that, that we've been taught that is so stupid. Instead of just letting the Scripture say what it says, the Lord has brought me to the realization that there are many within the church who believe that they've never received the Holy Ghost because those around them never confirmed or validated their experience. Maybe when they received the baptism, they were uh, alone. And they didn't even recognize. Remember what I said about you get the package and didn't even realize you got the package or what it was? You got the best gift is in the stocking, but because it's little and it kind of snuck in on you, you didn't even know it was there? Well, there are some people who've received the Holy Ghost baptism over the years in the Pentecostal movement didn't even know they got it. Richard King literally received the Holy Ghost while he was in a state of going to sleep or sleeping. And his wife said he had been seeking the Holy Ghost. She said all of a sudden one night they're lying in bed and he was laying there just as, as fast asleep as she could tell. She said, and he began to speak in tongues. Never realized that he had gotten the Holy Ghost, but he had the Holy Ghost. God is faithful. That's why I keep telling folks, don't worry about God. Don't worry about how God times things. Don't worry about how God does things. Paul told Timothy, Stir up the gift of God, which is within you. Sometimes we're asking God to give us something he's already given. Amen. But we didn't realize he had already given it. Because when we got it, it didn't look like we thought it looked. And it didn't do for us what we thought it would do when it came. Well, I thought if I got the Holy Ghost baptism, I'd have all the boldness in the world, and I could run out into the middle of the street and stop a tractor-trailer truck with my bare hand and witness to the man and see him get saved. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, you know, that's what I thought would happen when I got the Holy Ghost. But it didn't happen that way. So you think you don't have the Holy Ghost. Maybe when they received the baptism, they merely shouted with a loud, sustained shout, but you know what the Lord showed me? I'm getting just chills down my spine. You don't know how many tribes in distant lands use shouts like that to communicate across the miles. It says, just because you define a language one way doesn't mean I define a language that way. Jimmy Swaggart used to talk about a lady he knew in his church. <laughs> he says she used to get in the spirit and get happy in church and all of a sudden he says she's sitting and she'd just start going Whoo! and she'd put her finger up in the air while she'd go Whoo! Whoo! and he said that woman's nuts so one day he was in Africa preaching and the spirit of God began to move and the people were worshipping and all of a sudden hundreds of people began to do this exact same thing in Africa and Brother Swaggart looked at one of the African preachers and said, what are they doing? He said, Brother Swaggart, he said, in our custom, in our country, in our language, 
they're saying glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> he said that's how they do it. He said they just they use that vibra vibrato in their throat as they shout, and it, it, they just make that sound. Now you might have thought it sounded like a chicken getting its head cut off, but you see that was not merely a sound, Tommy. That was part of their language. And the Lord said, "We'll see if the package came." But we didn't identify the package for what it was because it didn't come the way we thought it would. And it didn't look like it, we thought it would look when it got there. We might have missed it. And in the meantime, through life, what happens is we have all kinds of other experiences and all kinds of other garbage and all kinds of other trash that we start stuffing into that stocking because guess what? We never reached into the toe. We never dug down to see that God had given us a gift. There was something down there. We just didn't know because we didn't recognize it for what it was. It didn't look like what we thought it would look like when it got there. And Paul is saying to Timothy today, he said, stir up that gift that is within you, Timothy. Get rid of some of that trash. Pull some of that stuff up out of there. Some of that bitterness that you've been feeling, throw it away. Because God's got something good in you. God's put something wonderful in you. Some of those negative feelings that you've been harboring, let go of them. Just let go of them. Let them go. Let them go, Timothy. Let go of all that garbage that is preventing that spring of living water from flowing out from, uh, from within you. So just let it go. Let it out. And as we start to let all this trash and all this life experience that has completely blocked in what God had placed in us, and we didn't even know it was there. Now, you all have to use your imaginations tonight because I don't want you, when I, when I do this, I want you to get the full impact of this. I want you to imagine what I'm about to pull out of here as being a real gift, as if it was for real, for real. Now reach into your stocking and go all the way to the toe. Now can you imagine if that ring is real? Can you imagine how much that booger would be worth? Woo! Well, that diamond got to be at least 40 carats. But you know what? It was buried in the toe. As valuable a gift as this potentially was it was in the toe of the stocking and you can easily overlook it and the Lord has brought to my attention that there are many people that have a gift that's in the toe of their stocking and they don't even know they've got it because there's so much false teaching and there's so much false ideology and over the years they've allowed life experience I had my grandfather my grandpa Bell told me years ago, now for many, 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 many years, Grandpa would talk about going to the Presque Isle revivals and all. That was back when he was a kid, and the Pentecostal movement was pretty new back then. And he told me many times about going to those revivals and what wonderful experiences they were and how he loved them. You know, he, oh, he loved to go to those. But then one day, Grandpa and I are sitting there talking, and Grandpa was telling me how they, one of those Revivals. I can't remember if it was Presque Isle or another city. Uh, Grandma Bill could tell me, but I can't remember. Bangor. Bangor, one of those places. But he said at one point, he said they they used to pray before church in the prayer room. He said, you know, all the people would. He said, boy, they'd get in that prayer room and be praying. He said, and boy, they'd pray like a house on fire. And he said, and one day he was there in that prayer room praying, and he said that somebody laid their hands on him or something. And he said, and the next thing I knew, I was just speaking in tongues. My grandfather never told me that he had received the Holy Ghost. But you see, for year after year after year, I think my grandfather allowed life experience. I think he allowed things in his life, things about himself. He, the enemy will use anything he can throw at you to create as much trash as he can so that whatever gift God's put in you, he can clog it up and prevent it from manifesting itself and coming to the surface.
and Grandpa was in World War II. And Grandpa had issues in his life that were difficult to deal with and things that he didn't understand about himself. And all these things just became all that clutter. But you know what's sad? Paul said to us tonight, stir up the gift that is within you. Grandpa didn't need to pray for God to give him the Holy Ghost. He already had the Holy Ghost. He needed to pray for God to stir up that gift. Lord, help that gift that you've already put in me. Bring it out. Bring it out and help help me to break through. It's kind of like a well. You know, wells can develop these iron deposits around the edge, along the stone and all. And sometimes if you're not careful, it'll wind up causing the well to not be accessible anymore. You've got to break through to get to the water again. And sometimes our life experience and just, just going through life, I, in the last 13, uh, 15 years, whatever it's been since 89, I've gone through so many things that were hard and hideous and stupid. I've had people do me dirty for no reason under the sun except just to be nasty. And I'm talking about experiences like I had with a landlord in uh, Brooklyn where this man decided Jason had AIDS and he was going to uh, kick us out and he knocked down our door and we had no door to our apartment for a month and we had to live in fear and we had to live worried that somebody would try to sneak into our apartment while we were sleeping. You know, I mean, what a horrible way to have to live. And we went through experiences like this. And to this day, I am still battling with, you wonder why sometimes I get ticked off real easy when people just don't act right. Because I've been done dirty too many times. I just don't have patience for it anymore. So years ago, Mom, I could handle stuff. Didn't bother me in the least. You know why? I had never experienced garbage like that. But once you've experienced so much of this ridiculous junk, then after a while, you just you can't respond to it like you used to. You, you know, you can't just let it go like you used to. But even I have to say, Lord, you really need to help me to stir up the gift that is within me so that that ring, so that that Holy Ghost down on the inside there somewhere can break through all this garbage and start to flow like I want it to flow. Because I'll tell you honestly, in my life, it's not flowing like it used to flow. I can tell you that right now. It's not. It's a trickle, not a stream. You know, it's, it's a stream, not a river. It's, it's just not what it used to be for me because I've had all these experiences and things that have crowded out what I used to be able to just kind of let go and let God do, you know. And I've had all these experiences that have just totally wore me out. I've told some of you know, some of y'all know some things, but I mean, I've, I've had a job where I was working at a car dealership making good money, had a good job, had a boss that was stealing from salesmen in the company, making off with our money that he was not even qualified, according to Toyota, to get. But he got away with it. And then when I went to the company owner about it, and found, I'm the one who discovered what he was doing. And when I went to the owner of the company, I was told, yeah, we'll take care of it, we'll take care of it. They never did. So I never did get my money. And at the same time, when the owner was out sick one day, this same man who pulled this stunt fired me and then had the audacity to tell the owner that I had quit and said that he could go blah, 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 himself. Folks, I'm going to tell you, when you go through experiences like that, after a while, it's just too much. You, you just get tired of being done stupid. You get tired of people being evil and nasty, especially when there's absolutely no good reason. When I ask somebody, hey, can you do me a favor? Your vehicle's still over that line. Could you just move it over a few more inches? All that person needs to say is, sure, yeah, I'm sorry, let me do that. Don't start arguing with us. Don't start complaining. Because, see, I want to tell you right now, where I'm at in my life today, I can't take it. Don't get stupid with me because I'm not in the mood. I've had too many people get stupid with me for no good reason. Yet, do you follow what I'm trying to say? And I'm not even making excuses for myself. I'm telling you honestly. I've, I'm con the Bible said confession is good for the soul. One thing I've always tried to be as a preacher is honest to the congregation. I've always tried to be truthful and honest. And when I say to you, I can tell you right now that 15 or 20 years ago when I was pastoring, you couldn't have made me cuss for all the money in the world. 
couldn't have done it. It wasn't in me. I just didn't have any, you know, I had no desire, no interest. I, it just wasn't even in my vocabulary at that time. Somebody could do the nastiest thing to me, and it would hurt me, yes, but I, I wouldn't even think to use bad words, you know. But when I came out in 1989 and went through year after year of being in the world. See, I had never been in the world before. I would never really been in the world. I'd only been around Christian people. That's who I dealt with and who I did business with. And that's all I knew was the church. So when I came out in 1989 and all of a sudden I was facing the real world, all those negative, bad, horrible experiences that I had in the real world left me very cluttered with a lot of junk in my stocking. So that when I came back to the Lord in 93, I had all this junk that I had to try to work out. I had all this junk I had to get out of the way so I could let that river flow again. And I was able to, 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 to do a lot of it, but there's still that residual ring that kind of prevents the, the, the river from flowing, and instead I just have a stream. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what I'm experiencing today. But, you know, this is why Paul said, stir up the gift of God. Stir it up. Sometimes you've got to put a stick in there and kind of stir things up a little bit. Break up that calcification. Break up that iron so that that water can begin to flow again. I want to tell you tonight, tongues is a specific gift of the Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians. Not everyone, listen to this now, not everyone will have the ability to speak in tongues every day of their lives. And I see most Pentecostal preachers won't tell you that. They're going to stand there and tell you, you need to speak in tongues every day. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's not true. When we receive the Holy Ghost baptism, we will speak. We will utter. We will communicate through some manner or means of language known somewhere on earth, but not to us. Like I said, if that means you scream out, hee-haw, hee-haw, and if that... If that happens to be how the people in, in Papua New Guinea say, thank you, Jesus, glory to God, well then, honey, you got the Holy Ghost as well as anybody else did. And just because it wasn't in a big package under the tree doesn't mean you don't got it. Check the toe. Look in the toe of your stocking. You may have a gift or the gift already.